So we'll start with um, neurological exam. So I'll look for the patellar reflex, L234. Just straddle that patellar tendon. Maybe put just a little support beneath the leg. It tends to bring out the reflexes nicely. The reflex hammer should be used in a very kind of a loose whip-like action. And find your target. Compare sides. And that's L234. The S1, the ankle reflex, is best done if you just take one finger, lightly preload that Achilles just a little bit, and you're kind of tenting those toes down, and again, a very light action. I'll try to get out of the way of the camera, but just like that, again, compare sides. We'll do plantar response, checking, looking for that Babinski flare of the toes as pathologic. And you go along the outer foot and curve along the forefoot, uh, both sides. And then I'll look at ankle clonus. Just a quick little upward raise. A couple beats is OK. Sustained four or six beats. Sustained clonus is abnormal, indicative of an upper motor neuron lesion, as is the Babinski sign. So I'll do that both sides. Then I'll look at straight leg raising. Here, it's a good position to do that. Go ahead and straighten the leg. Then I'll add kind of a seated Lesegs maneuver. Bring your foot up. And I'm looking for root tension signs. Does that recreate any back, buttock, leg pain, tingling, any sensation with that? No. And again, do both sides. Then I'll do my sensory exam. I, I tend to use a pinwheel. And I'll often start with this L3 distribution here, and what I want you to do is let me know if this feels dull, extra sensitive, if there's any differences side to side, and I'll just test, and I'll go in pairs. Sometimes I'll come up and do L2 or even L1. Down here, I like this area for L4 root testing. This is a little bit mixed, L5, S1 kind of mixture there, L5, dorsal foot, S1, outer foot. So I'll go through those, both sides. Let's do some strength testing. I'll start with hip flexor strength testing. Go ahead and pull up, and then I make sure it's anti-gravity. Push down, there we go. And I'll do that on both sides, L2 largely, L1, 2, 3 mixture, and upper motor neuron lesions can result in hip flexor weakness as well. So push into my hand, so I'm resisting the quads, L2, 3, 4, pull back, hamstrings, L4, 5, S1, S2, bring your feet up. And here's largely anterior tibialis, assisted by the other extensors. And pull up, up the toes. So it's an L4-5 toe extension, extensor hallucis longus. Pull up, largely L5. Bring the feet up and out, the ankle everters. And I'm kind of doing this. I'm, I'm just pulling down and in. You don't want to pull the entire leg because that stresses the whole system. People have pain, they have pain inhibition. So I'm just kind of doing that. And that's largely S1. S2 a little, L5 a little bit. If I want to test S1 another way, go ahead and step down. Toe walking is good for that. And a few steps, any, any sense of weakness one side or the other. Heel walk, go ahead and do this. And that brings out L4 and 5 weakness. If you're really suspicious of S1, um, I can have them, you can balance on the table, but one-legged toe raises. Do 10 each side, look for any asymmetry. And then I look at, um, I'll do some gait assessment, but for now let's look at the back exam withstanding. And so I'm looking at alignment, top of the crest, greater trogue, posterior superior iliac spines. I'm looking at the lordosis, kyphosis, lordosis balance. I'm looking for any scoliosis. And then I palpate a little bit over the spinous processes, paraspinals, and a little deeper into the facet joint area. And let me know if I hit a tender area. 
and I just walk down through. When I get to the PSIS, that's a transition from lumbar to SI joint below that. And so I'll follow the SI joints. If there's any sacral coccygeal issues, I'll palpate. Off the bottom of the V of the sacrum come the piriformis muscles, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius and minimus, and um, I'm looking at the greater trochanters, the insertion site there, ischial tuberosity when it seems indicated, hamstrings, etc. Go ahead and bend forward. I'll have my thumbs on the PSIS and come on up. And I'm looking for guarding hitches when they come up. Any pain with that? Did that recreate any pain? And um, that stresses the lumbar discs. It can stress the SI joints and other structures, but largely those. Go ahead and arch back. Now straight backward bending can aggravate a central disc protrusion as well. So I look for midline pain or any pain over the SI joints in the facet areas. Does that cause you any pain? Then I'll have them rotate. So this arching, twisting, extension, rotation maneuver loads those facet joints. It can really uh, bring out facet pain. If you can do this without pain in both directions, then it's less likely to be facet generated pain. It also closes the foramina. Extension also narrows the canal. So if we see not so much facet paralumbar pain, but radiating symptoms with this that start here and below, that clues me into a radicular pain process due to stenosis and relax. So that's a real good start to an exam. And if you're uh, in a primary care setting or you are busy, this is a good screen. Um, you can look at some sacroiliac joint uh, specific portions of the exam. Raise your right knee with my finger on the PSIS. It rides down as it should. Try the left side. This is Gillet's test, looking at the kinetics of the SI joints. Let's do a one-legged squat. So raise this knee, do a little squat, and you're looking at hip strength. Is there a Trendelenburg sign? Come on up. Any instability, weakness of the quads, um, and it's a, a strength test pretty well. Now, raise that knee again and arch back. This is good. You get the young football player gymnast and you are suspicious of a PARS defect. This really loads that PARS. So this is a, a very specific, good, not a specific, but a good sensitive test for that. Um, then I'll have uh, the patient lie on your back with your head up here. Please submit. Thanks. And again, we're getting into more specific, uh, specialized portions of the exam. These are if you want to layer in extra, extra portions of the exam. And I do pelvic distraction. Now I'll do it from this angle, but the key is to kind of open book the pelvis. Some people cross over to push down and out so that we stress the SI joints largely. Uh, if indicated, you can palpate pubic symphysis, look for asymmetry of the pelvis. Straight leg raise again in the supine position. Then raise your leg up and I'm going to bring that foot down for Lasegg's maneuver. We're tensioning the roots. Any pain, tingling, and it should be noted. Let the knee bend. Let as I stabilize the pelvis to prevent torsion through the lumbar spine, let the knee fall. We're stressing the hip. We're stressing both SI joints with this Patrick's or Faber test. And then I'll just do some loose, kind of look at the range of motion at the hip. But then I'll do a more formal internal rotation over pressure, which is pretty specific to hip joint or sensitive for hip joint related pain. Then I'll do a little bit of a, a scour type test, looking at that anterior hip, uh, looking for impingement, flexion, abduction, internal rotation, also stresses the piriformis muscle, so that's a good test for that. Um, then I will put some downward 
thigh thrust. This maneuvers the thigh thrust. And I'll scour and put some downward pressure, stressing the SI joint. Go ahead and scoot towards me. If you want to do the James lens maneuver, go ahead and bring your knee up and really grab your thigh and pull that up. Flex that up and let this drop off the table. And you can see that we're portioning the pelvis, stressing the SI joints again. And relax down. And um, those are some basic hip and SI joint stress maneuvers. And generally, I will start with cervical motion. Go ahead and bend your head forward. And I'll ask that they let us know, let me know, if there's any discomfort, even mild, any tingling, any symptoms at all. So I'm looking for perhaps if there's a cervical central disc herniation, pain into the upper back, that type of thing. Any tingling, I'll note that. Go ahead and bend back. Is there a stenosis that's worse with extension, creating neurological radicular symptoms? Is there a focal facet? area of pain, come on up, bend to the side, this closes the foramina, it stresses the facet joints, it even tugs a little bit on the contralateral roots, and we'll do both sides of that, turn this way, and again, stressing the joints, and tilt back, a quadrant maneuver, I don't do a formal spurlings, I don't, I think that's too much to push down. But just getting into this position may elicit ridiculous symptoms or focal facet pattern pain. And we'll do that both sides. Go ahead and relax. Then I'll start looking at some of the entrapment neuropathy testing that we do. For instance, tunnels over the carpal tunnel. Is the, is, does it elicit tingling? Guyens canal over the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve at the ulnar groove at the elbow. Just distal and medial. And so I'll go from cubital tunnel all the way up into the distal upper arm. Also, just hyperflex, see if there's any subluxation of the ulnar nerve. And we'll do some static testing. I'll have them assume a phalens test position and hold that. Does that elicit any tingling or other symptoms or local pain? Looking for carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, reverse phalens, we can do elbow flexion testing, so go ahead up here. And again, this is tenting the ulnar nerve. Does it elicit symptoms? We tend to do this when we sleep, and we do this when we sleep. So, you know, they're, they're good tests to do to uh, check in to those things. All right, thoracic outlet syndrome testing. I don't always do it, but when indicated, go ahead and look that way. This is Wright's maneuver. I'm feeling for the pulse to see if it goes away. I'm palpating over pec minor, anterior scalenes, plexus, and does this elicit any tingling or other painful sensations? Relax down. Then I'll get into my neurological exam. So I'll start with biceps reflex testing. When, we, when I reflex test, I use a very loose motion, stretch, put a little stretch on that biceps tendon, and go ahead and check that, C5-6, brachioradialis, I put my thumb over that and actually strike my thumb so I'm not striking the superficial radial sensory nerve, that doesn't feel good, C6, triceps reflex. I'm coming just proximal to the electronon process. And relax here. There we go. And try and get that with the relaxation. You can do it this way as well. I know you can't see that, but I'm striking the same area. And then with my next screening first exam, I will also check patellar and Achilles reflexes just to make sure that there aren't any brisk reflexes that would point to a possible upper motor neuron lesion, perhaps with a cervical myelopathy. Same with plantar responses and clonus testing. Then I'll get into sensory examination. So I often start and I'll say, tell me if there's any difference from side to side when I test, any dullness, hypersensitivity. I'll look at this police patch area axillary nerve C5, and I'll do both sides. Up here, more a C4 area. Down in this 
dorsal radial aspect of the hand, radial sensory nerve, C6 or 7, it's a crossover area. And I have them put your palms up, and I'll go side to side, I'll look at the thumb, which is C6 largely, median nerve, median nerve for the index finger, a crossover of C6 or 7, C7 to the middle finger, still in that median sensory distribution, C7-8 crossover, also the fourth digit is a crossover of median sensory and ulnar sensory. The little finger, fifth digit, is C8, ulnar. We can get up into a little T1 up in here, and I'll go on to strength testing. Arms up like this, push up against me. And I'm looking at C5, C6, arms out like this. Then we have the biceps, C5, 6, pull. Now push out against me. Triceps, C7 largely, some 6 and 8. Bring your wrists back towards you. Wrist extension is radial nerve, but it's C6 largely, some C7. Pull back. Good. Now put your fingers straight out like that. Lift up with the fingers, still radial nerve, but this is more C7 oriented. Spread your fingers, don't let me squeeze them together. And I always generally test these both at one time, but I test one. Don't let me squeeze them together. Older nerve, C8, T1. Squeeze my fingers real hard. All right, so you've got uh, some median ulnar long finger flexors, but this is a C8, largely a C8 function. Hold your palm up, thumb straight up in the air, and I'll step around and come from this direction. So I'll say, don't let me move your thumb. I'm coming from this direction. Abductor pollicis brevis, median nerve, C8, T1. So I've done that. I like to look at hip flexor at least. I'll do it lower extremities in their entirety usually, but bring that knee up against me. Again, upper motor neuron pattern weakness will often show up in the hip flexors. So go ahead and step down. And let me jump behind here. This, And I'll do an inspection and palpation part of the exam, looking for asymmetry. I palpate starting that upper cervical occipital ridge area. Um, you can get on the lesser and greater occipital nerves, the upper cervical musculature. Walk down, out into the upper traps, levator scapula, medial scapular muscles, including the middle trap and rhomboid major muscles, and palpate out. I may do a shoulder exam if indicated. <clears throat> I may come forward and look at that upper rib, anterior scalene area, uh, pec minors from behind, that type of thing. All right.